Bewusst, we came. And to it, we return. This is one of the last temperate rainforests in the world. Remote. Primeval. And pulsing with life. If there's a paradise on Earth, this just might be it. The Alexander Archipelago of Southern Alaska. And at the crest of the food chain is one of the most majestic creatures on the planet. This is the biggest, most magnificent predator on the block. But everywhere, its ancient haunts are under siege. As the modern world closes in, this could be the great brown bear's last stronghold. To protect this extraordinary species, researchers have to learn more about its secret life deep within the forest, and quickly. A veteran tracker joins forces with a new technology that may allow us to enter the bear's ancient territory without risking a close encounter of the grizzly kind. The Alexander Archipelago. More than a thousand islands clustering off the coast of Western Canada. Originally mountain summits, they are blanketed by dense ancient woodlands. These are some of the last temperate rainforests on Earth. When most people think of rainforests, this is what they have in mind. Lush. Wet. Warm. A steaming jungle. This is the tropical rainforest. Young leafy trees. A huge variety of wildlife. By contrast, the temperate rainforest is relatively cool. It grows in coastal areas, and its trees are mainly spruce and hemlock, often between 500 and 1,000 years old. It is less diverse than the tropical rainforest, but no less imposing. It is a place where land and sea come together, to form a whole greater than the sum of its parts. The islands have names like Chichagov, Admiralty, Baranov, Prince of Wales. Remote from urban centers, it is a world few humans have penetrated. As a result, this vibrant ecosystem is a kind of heaven on Earth. And the variety of wildlife here is astounding. The pristine rivers are alive with countless fish. Amidst the islands, killer whales breach. and humpbacks plunge. Dolls porpoises and stellar sea lions feast in the food-rich waters.
Sitka black-tailed deer make their home in these woodlands, always alert for natural enemies. And the lord of this southern Alaska paradise is this mighty beast. You may know this bear as the grizzly. Like the forests it roams, this bear is both majestic and mysterious. In North America, brown bears are often called grizzlies, though biologists reserve the term grizzly for inland brown bears and use brown for bears that live on the coast. Genetically, the two are identical. Whatever this bear is called, it is not a bear to be taken lightly. It can weigh more than half a ton and yet reach speeds of almost 40 miles per hour. The brown bear is arguably the world's largest land carnivore. You might think that honor goes to its cousin, the polar bear, but many scientists classify the polar bear as a marine mammal because it spends most of its life in the ocean or on sea ice. On land, the grizzly is king. It can rise up to nine feet in height. Bears are formidable hunters. They have a keen sense of smell, seven times more powerful than a dog's. And they are notoriously patient in stalking their prey. But the grizzly is also a fiercely private animal and usually avoids the company even of its own species. Any human trespassing on its space is asking for trouble. And that includes biologists who'd like to get close enough to learn more about this reclusive animal. In the rainforest, the brown bear rules. It has no natural predators. And yet, worldwide, its numbers have been in decline for the last hundred years. In the early 1900s, more than 100,000 brown bears roamed the western United States. Today, only about 1,000 remain. Across the planet, their range has been cut in half since 1900. In the Pyrenees, on the border between France and Spain, the brown bears were just hanging on. They were down to their last female. Recently, hunters shot her, thereby dooming this population of bears to extinction. Today, roughly 40,000 brown bears live in what might be their last stronghold, the state of Alaska. But every day, humans encroach a little more on their territory. And once again, as in the ancient story, it's man who has brought trouble to paradise. Consumers demand an immense amount of lumber each year to build homes, furniture, and other creature comforts. The inevitable result, forest clear-cutting and the roads built to carry out the trees.
On Chichigof Island, many bears tend to converge on river valleys during the summer months. But over the last 20 years, roads have cut deep into this once virgin wilderness. And timber clear-cutting has turned some of the bears' summer stomping grounds into stump fields. As human activities extend further into the grizzly's ancient domain, humans and bears are meeting more and more often. It is a recipe for disaster for bears, and sometimes for people. This massive predator can be extremely dangerous when suddenly confronted by a human on its turf. And yet, to protect these animals, researchers need to learn more about their numbers, their movements, and their vulnerabilities. They have to get up close and personal with a 500-pound animal that doesn't want them there. That's exactly what one man does for a living, and has for the last 30 years. Born in Wisconsin, Laverne Beyer came from a family of hunters. He arrived in southeast Alaska in 1970 and fell in love with the wilderness. Three years later, Laverne started working with the Alaska Fish and Game Department tracking and capturing bears for government research. It was a job he was born to do. I've either lived with or worked with bears like my entire adult life, since I was 17 years old. And when I was 20 years old, then uh, I had to shoot a bear in self-defense. And once you have to uh, shoot a bear in self-defense. That's kind of one of the events in your life you don't forget. Over the years, Laverne has evolved from a trapper into a researcher himself. Largely self-taught, he works on the cutting edge of bear research technology here in Southeast Alaska. Based on a 70-year-old tugboat, Laverne has captured more than 700 bears since 1975 and is now one of the most respected bear trackers and researchers in the region. Someone who combines traditional tracking skills and the best that modern technology has to offer. I'm a man who's stuck in the wrong time period because I, I appreciate things from the past. I definitely appreciate technology, and, and I guess it's somewhat like too bad a person couldn't live in the past, but yet have some technology of the future. Technology of the present includes VHF and GPS radio tracking collars, which Laverne and his colleagues use to get a sense of the bear's movements. He wants to know how their range is changing over time in response to clear cutting and road construction. Before you can attach a radio collar, though, you have to capture the bear. Laverne and his fish and game colleagues have been studying Chichigoff Island bears since 1989. Jack Whitman is part of that team. Chichigoff is one of the continent's largest islands, with an area of over 2,000 square miles. About 1,100 people live there and about 1,600 brown bears. As they prepare for their research expedition into the brown bear's domain, they're all too aware of how alert they have to be. We're trespassing in a pretty major way in, in places where brown bears live, where most people shouldn't go. It would be foolish regardless you know, how one feels about bears, not to carry a weapon.
An ancient trail leads into the world of the bear. This is a bear trail, it's not a people trail. Yeah, no, there's no people come down here. Years of bear traffic have cut this path through the forest. The bears are out of sight, but their presence is everywhere. You can probably see bear hair still attached. Big knot of bear hair there. To learn where bears roam off the beaten path, Laverne and Jack want to deploy a radio collar. And that means they have to catch a bear. The art of snaring a bear without injuring it is a delicate one. In order to direct its path into the trap, you have to think like a bear thinks. You have to choreograph its movements. A bear has to hit a bullseye right here. Okay. We're trying to force that foot into that spot. Okay, so when he, you know, he's walking down the trail here, he has hit that per perfectly without touching the cable there. You know, plus you're trying to create his step for him, too. This stuff here kind of leads him into to this bullseye. If he steps on this, you know, cable here a little bit, you know, it's not going to catch him. The snare is set, but can it fool a bear? As the trackers make their way through the forest, their senses are on high alert for any sign of movement. One of their snares has been triggered, but it didn't catch a bear. Clean mist too. Threw the cable way back there, you know, and pulled it up. This here's been bumped a little, coming that way. It's coming, going that way. Yeah, I think he stepped on this. Kind of looking at. One thing is sure, there are bears close by. It's nice working down here where there's there's some targets out there. It's a target-rich environment. They try again and move on. Finally, after hours of tracking bear sign and checking traps, Laverne spots a grizzly in the river near where they've set a snare. It could be headed toward the trap. Now the key is staying silent, motionless, and downwind. They pick out motion, uh, so you move slow you know, and, and deliberate, and if preferably you uh, move when, when they're not looking at you. Once this bear has entered the woods, it is virtually invisible. I'm trying to determine whether the bear knows if we're here or not by the wind. The wind's kind of going right towards it. After nearly 30 minutes, Laverne and Jack hear signs that the bear's been caught, but how firmly the snare has grabbed its foot is unclear. At this point, it's kind of, how is this all gonna play out? You know, we're along, we're, there's other things that are going to happen here to determine whether it's a good capture, a bad capture, an ugly capture. A tranquilizer dart is the most gentle way to put a bear to sleep so they can attach the radio collar and do their research. For now, the animal seems relatively calm. Once, once the bear 
definitely discovers that we're here, it could be a different story. The body language could be different. It could become more aggressive. These woodsmen are skilled at keeping their bear encounters from turning violent. Still, they never enter the forest unarmed. Regardless of the size of the bear, they're capable of you know, injuring and killing people. So it's just prudent to carry a weapon. And in hopes you don't have to use it. White eagle feathers, good luck. To make sure he places the dart accurately, Jack has to get within 10 yards of a 500 pound, and now very aggravated, bear. As he lines up his sight, Laverne covers him, just in case. When the bear shifts its position, they can see just how tenuous the snare's grip is. A sudden jerk, and this angry bear could be on them in the blink of an eye. Luckily, the tranquilizer is already taking effect. If not, the bear might easily have pulled free. Minutes later, she's out. And the researchers can go to work. But Laverne and Jack know that another bear could be watching them. Their every sense is attuned to movements and sounds coming from the trees. They waste no time. First, a blood sample. Then, the radio collar. Radio tracking is an indispensable tool for assessing the movement patterns of a population of bears. Each collar has a unique frequency, so each bear has a unique frequency. It allows us to hear where she is. Today, the forest has let them in. It remains to be seen if it will let them leave. The woods are eerily quiet. Suddenly, they realize they're being watched. A bear attack. Laverne had no choice but to shoot. A day that began so auspiciously has ended in heartbreak. The forest let Laverne live this time, but also forced him to confront a grim reality. Sometimes this work exacts a terrible price. The attack has left Laverne with more than just emotional scars. I, I kind of, I feel responsible. You know, I did not want to pull that trigger. I did not want to kill her. You know, it was, it was like shooting a friend. You 
know, and felt, ah, you know, we're trying to, we're trying to help you. We're trying to help her or help the species. You know, she doesn't know that. And I don't want to shoot you. Can't you understand that, you know, we're not trying to hurt you? Brown bears are normally solitary creatures. And most of their time is spent finding food and eating. This is especially important for mother bears. These twins were born during winter. They depend upon their mother's milk. She must find enough food to sustain herself and her family. In early summer, brown bears commonly eat berries, grasses, and other vegetarian fare. But each year around July, their diet dramatically changes. And it all begins here. Enfolding the islands of southeast Alaska are the rich waters of the Inside Passage. The passage is home to some of the most spectacular animals on the planet. rich waters welling up from the Pacific depths nurture a flourishing food chain. Massive schools of fish thrive on rich plankton and attract an army of predators. Humpback whales gather to feast, working in groups to capture herring. Dolls' porpoises rely on speed to catch their prey. But sometimes they are not fast enough to escape this mighty hunter. On shore, another mighty hunter is getting impatient, waiting for its share. For in a coastal rainforest, the worlds of sea and land are intimately connected. And the ocean's emissary to the rainforest is this remarkable pilgrim, the salmon. Chinook, coho. Sockeye, pink, and chum. Five species of salmon make the long trip back from the ocean to the place of their birth. After several years at sea, they've returned to spawn for the first and last time. These weary travelers have overcome crushing odds to make it this far. Now, they're running on empty. But this is their only chance to breed. Doggedly, they push on. These sockeye have not eaten since leaving the sea. 
and they will never eat again. Starving, they begin to digest themselves from the outside in. Absorbing their silver scales, they expose skin, which turns scarlet and smooth. At the same time, the head turns green, and the male snout takes a grotesque turn. Now, they're in full mating regalia. When they reach the spawning grounds, a female thrashes out a nest. The male shadows her, ready to do his part. The spawning rituals culminate under cover of night. A female shudders with the effort of expelling her eggs. Her mate shudders in reply, fertilizing them with a smoky stream of milk. A female can lay 1,000 eggs per nest, and she may build several before she dies. But it's only a few that make it this far. Most will perish long before then from marine predators or sheer exhaustion. Or we'll have to run a gauntlet of hungry bears who have been waiting months for just this moment. Bears are patient hunters, and for animals their size, their striking speed is phenomenal. This is a time of feasting for leaner days ahead. Often the bears don't even bother with the salmon meat. They're after the fattier and more nutritious parts, the eggs, the brain, the skin. Recent studies suggest that the bears perform a vital service for the rainforest, transporting the nutrient-laden salmon from the river to the woods where the fish decompose and fertilize the soil. But bears aren't the only hunters on Chichigoff Island today. Brown bear hunting is legal in Alaska. Brown bear hunting season is open until the 20th of May. No matter how Laverne may feel personally about the practice, big game hunting is a popular sport in Alaska. If it's going to happen anyway, Laverne wants to make sure it's done properly and the right bears are taken. Brown bears are the second slowest reproducing big game animal in North America. The female component of the bear population is the component that you want to protect the most. With more than three decades experience, few guides are better equipped to track an Alaskan brown bear than Laverne. But he's here for one reason and one reason only to make sure that if a bear is going to be shot, it's going to be a mature male bear. Laverne operates by another rule as well. He never guides in the same areas where he conducts his research. Today, he's accompanying a hunter to nearby Admiralty Island. We're looking, for, we're looking for a male bear, which is a male bear, to identify a male bear has to be a eight foot bear or larger or like a 22 and a half inch skull or larger. It's the body movement, uh, yeah, body structure. That bear there has about a 20 inch skull. Which means it's likely a female and off limits.
This bear too is a female. The hunter may be frustrated, but Laverne won't allow a female to be shot. bear on a beach and we're gonna go take a little closer look see what it looks like. This is a large old male. So Laverne gives the green light. The hunter lines up his scope. What an animal. My God. My God. When they reach the bear, he is still alive. Laverne makes sure he is put out of his misery quickly. Human encroachment, whether in the form of hunting or road construction, is simply a fact of life in our primal forests. Bear advocates, like Laverne Beyer, have to learn as much as they can about the bears as soon as they can. In their ongoing attempts to penetrate the mysteries of southeast Alaska's rainforest, investigators have used advanced technologies. The earliest high-tech tool was the radio tracking collar. GPS devices were a big step forward. They make use of dozens of orbiting satellites to calculate the precise location of a tagged animal, sometimes within three feet. But GPS only tells researchers where the animal is, not what it's doing. What they really needed was a way of getting a video and audio recorder into the deep forest, where it could show them natural behavior, the kind of behavior humans rarely see because our very presence changes the way animals behave. Fortunately, just such a device exists. It's called Critter Cam. Critter Cam is the brainchild of marine biologist Greg Marshall. Its purpose is to show us the natural world from the animal's point of view. Over the last 15 years, CritterCam has gathered remarkable video, audio, and environmental data from a wide array of creatures. From great white sharks and blue whales, to emperor penguins and leatherback sea turtles. For the first time, we are able to see what the creature sees and enter its world without conditioning its natural behavior. In fact, just off the coast here, Critter Cam recently brought back remarkable footage of one of the region's most impressive marine mammals, the humpback whale. Critter Cam revealed how humpbacks hunt together beneath the surface. Some whales herd the fish. One blows a ring of bubbles. One calls to scare the fish into the bubble net. And then the entire group rises to engulf the hapless herring.
the first time, scientists could penetrate the murky waters and watch the whales behave. And this suggested another possible use for this technology, this time on a nearby land mammal. Because as experienced a tracker as Laverne is, he's never been able to watch brown bears in the thick of the forest. The GPS has been used on wildlife here in the past few years. Well, the, the next step for scientists is Curticam technology, you know, seeing visually the wildlife's viewpoint. After years of success using critter cam to study sea life, Marshall and his team have developed a critter cam for land animals. This terrestrial version presents challenges the underwater device never had to face. For one thing, since audio and video signals don't travel through water, all data is recorded to an onboard tape, which is automatically released after six hours. There's no transmission with marine critter cam, so interference isn't an issue. But a rainforest is something else entirely. It's an interference machine. So engineer Dave Rash and his colleagues have put in thousands of hours making sure terrestrial critter cam was up to the job. Every element of the device had to be tested and retested, and then retested again. But it will all be worth it if Critter Cam brings back information that can help researchers protect the species. Still, lab testing only gets you part way. The Critter Cam team needed to find out how it performed on a live animal before they got into the field with a wild grizzly. How you doing? This is Damascus the grizzly bear. He's about a five-year-old guy. Lay down, lay down, be a good boy. Look at that thing, look at that thing. What do you think of that? Will you let us put that on, see if you can, we can get your perspective on life? Hmm. Feed me, and I'm yours. Hmm. Come here, just look around. Just walk up here, take a bear walk. What do you think? Let's record. And one last test. Because even though this critter cam won't be diving to the ocean depths, there is still a good chance it's going to get wet. This is as far as Dave is going to get with a tame bear in controlled surroundings. It's time to head north. The terrestrial critter cam can dispense with the heavy recording mechanism and transmit directly to a remote receiver. Which is a good thing, because the device won't be buoyed up by water, as the marine version was. Another plus, the device won't be limited by the length of a videotape. Still, there's a very real danger that even if critter cam makes it into the woods on the back of a bear, the dense forest will frustrate the team's efforts to get a clear signal. You know, in the, the Temper Rainforest Southeast Alaska, to make the critter cam technology work that you currently have today is, is quite challenging. It's, it's not the plains of Africa. First step. Before going after a bear, field test critter cam on a somewhat less dangerous animal. What's going on here? <laughs> I'm going up <laughs> testing the, the Greg Marshall critter cam. <laughs> How do you feel about it? <laughs> yeah, stop the debate about whether it's going to work through the, through the forest or not. It doesn't take long to see the shape of things to come. Well, we're just uh, tracking Vern as he walks up the canyon. And, uh, 
the signals that I'm getting aren't as strong as I expect. Dave quickly tracks down the source of the problem. This antenna has connections on it which are very clearly marked. Even the best labelled uh, things are, are no match for stupidity sometimes. Now we've got uh, much better video. Check it out. Hey, there's somebody holding an antenna. There's only so much preparation Dave can do. They'll have to try it out on a real bear and make adjustments as they go. We've come all this way, put in all this effort to get to this point and uh, I don't want my electronic part to be the thing that, that makes it not happen today. So I'm nervous. The effort will all be worthwhile if CritterCam can bring back information that will help safeguard these bears' future. CritterCam may be light years more advanced than a radio collar, but the process of getting it on a bear is just the same. You carefully check various snare locations to see if a bear has been caught. The morning wears on, and only empty or sprung traps are found. Finally, a snare with a bear. It's a small bear, a juvenile, but it will do just as well as a large one for the lightweight critter cam. Another bear could be nearby, so everyone keeps their eyes and ears open. Dave, you ready with that thing yet? Mm -hmm. yeah. that, that can be locked in? That wants that pin. She's on. Until you hit the button, huh? Can you push that little thing in there? The device is locked in place and set to transmit. Time to wake up the bear. We've seen this shot many times before, but we've never seen anything quite like this. She doesn't seem to mind the critter cam around her neck at all. The bear is groggy, but she knows enough to head straight into the woods. System's working. She's right on the edge of the range but the signals are really marginal i think she's right over on the other hill it might be better for us to um, to move over there if we can now i guess the work begins as we track the animal and see where it goes so we might have our knot cut out for us as morning becomes afternoon the team follows the critter cam signal to stay within range. Dave continually monitors the system's performance in this difficult terrain. Suddenly, an animal known for its solitary nature shows its softer side. Right there, through the bear with her. Just having, having a greeting right now. That might be mom. This is a complete surprise. 
The critter-cammed bear is old enough that Laverne wouldn't have expected it to be spending any time with its mother. As the video starts to flow more clearly, they see some of the most intimate pictures ever captured of bear life in the depths of the forest. She builds a daybed and curls up for a nap. Hey, that was cool. The fact that she joined up with two of the bears. Oh. Did he actually just say cool? He did. Wow. I thought it was cool, and I think he smiled. When the bear wakes up, an excited Critter Cam team watches as she eats some Devil's Club berries, a staple of the brown bear diet. Oh, check it out, yeah. Then she appears to eat a toad, not something her species is known to consume very often. But berries and toads are just appetizers for a brown bear. Soon the bears head to the stream for the entree. And the young female is in the midst of it all. Laverne and the others are glued to the monitor. It's been a remarkable day. Critter Cam has allowed Laverne and the others to walk with these bears without trampling their world. And what they are seeing bodes well for future research research that could tip the odds in favor of these amazing animals. It took thousands of years to create the rainforests of Alaska's Alexander Archipelago. They comprise some of the most pristine wilderness in the world. And they could be gone in just a few generations. The future of road building in southeast Alaska is unclear. But what is clear is that more roads would mean more pressure on the bear's home territory. And more encounters between human and bear. The brown bear's best hope may lie with researchers and advocates like Laverne Beyer a man who has seen grizzly bears die, sometimes at his own hand, and knows all too well the cost of unrestrained human expansion. There are undoubtedly many stories hidden within the thick shadows of the northern rainforest. For now, though, it has surrendered only some of them. Time alone will tell if it can be persuaded to relinquish more. To purchase Bear Island on DVD, call 1-800-PLAY-PBS.
Coffee Boss yan. Masarong kam! Ay ni Hao, Hwan Ying Guang Ling. Welcome! Selamat datang! Welcome! The Borneo rainforest is the oldest in the world, 130 million years old. That's 70 million years older than the Amazon. Mount Kinabalu, the dominant feature in the Kinabalu Park, is the highest peak between the Himalayas and New Guinea. The Kinabalu Park is a World Heritage Site and has a total area of 75,370 hectares. By comparison, Singapore has a land area of about 64,000 hectares. Out of the 12 regions of mega biodiversity in the world, Borneo ranks with the Amazonia and Equatorial Africa. Borneo lies in the heart of the mega biodiversity ecoregion of the Indo Pacific Basin and Malaysia. Sabah is special because, in terms of biodiversity per unit area, Sabah is the best in Borneo. According to the National Geographic, 10 square kilometers of Malaysian rainforest has more flora and fauna than that of North America and Europe combined. 